On this Friday night, Russia on a war footing. Urgent calls for the Kremlin to back down over Ukraine or else. It will be met with swift, severe, and a united response. And Ottawa's new commitment to Kyiv. Doctors facing discrimination. They've moved elsewhere because of the racism. The growing uproar after our exclusive interview with a New Brunswick doctor. Has the fifth wave finally peaked? Canada's top doctor on the positive signs and plans for future vaccine doses. Plus, rest in paradise. I would do anything for love. A rock superstar is silenced. No, I won't do How Meatloaf found his voice. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Canada is sending more help to Ukraine amid growing fears that a Russian invasion is imminent. Ottawa is providing a loan of $120 million. The Prime Minister says those funds will support Ukraine's economic resilience. We're also exploring other options to provide financial and other supports. And again, Canada calls on Russia to de-escalate and engage in meaningful dialogue. Talks between the U.S. Secretary of State and his Russian counterpart ended today without any breakthrough and a pretty frosty handshake. Both sides did agree that talks should continue, but as Jackson Prosko explains, there's little hope of finding a diplomatic solution. As Russia released new video of military drills and its buildup on Ukraine's doorstep, the country's foreign minister sat down with the U.S. Secretary of State in Geneva, seeking diplomatic deterrence. This was not negotiation, but a candid exchange of concerns and ideas. Amid the unspoken threat of invasion, Russia's Vladimir Putin wants major concessions, a withdrawal of NATO from former Soviet states, and guarantees against future NATO expansion, including into Ukraine. The U.S. will respond to those demands in writing, but is unlikely to concede, and has already vowed a swift and severe response to any Russian invasion. I hope the emotions will cool down, but there are no guarantees, said Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. In eastern Ukraine, the situation grows more tense. The U.S. is deploying military helicopters to the region. More countries are sending anti-tank weapons and ammunition. Putin, though, may still see an opening, with some NATO members indicating reluctance to respond to anything less than a full-scale Russian invasion. What measures will be taken will be agreed among everyone in due course, said Germany's new chancellor. It's not just what Putin will accept, it's just what everybody else will accept. Fiona Hill was the top Russia advisor to several American presidents. With Putin's motives uncertain and his goals unclear, she says avenues away from conflict look increasingly slim. Putin seems to have painted himself into a corner. If there's good news, it's that both sides are still talking and attempts at diplomacy show no sign of slowing down. The next step could involve another direct conversation between Putin and U.S. President Joe Biden. Jeff? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks, Jackson. The U.S. is also giving the green light for the Baltic states, NATO allies, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, to send their American-made weapons to support Ukraine. Canada, as mentioned earlier, is sending financial aid, and as Mike Lukator explains, Ottawa is also exploring other options. At a time when Ukraine needs military might, Canada is sending money, promising up to $120 million in loans to counter Russian aggression and destabilization. We're happy to be there to uh, reinforce the resilience and the strength of Ukraine's economy faced with Russian destabilization, including economic destabilization. Trudeau says the loan was one of the top asks from Ukraine's leadership. Friday, President Volodymyr Zelensky sent a tweet of thanks, underlining the devotion to the spirit of special partnership between our two countries. And Trudeau had this message from Moscow. Any movement of Russian troops into Ukraine will be absolutely unacceptable and uh, met with a clear response from the international community. 
But how strongly is Canada willing to respond? Canadian soldiers are already on the ground in Ukraine training their troops as part of Operation Unifier. And behind the scenes, there is contingency planning to take a more aggressive stance. In an interview with Mercedes Stevenson for Sunday's edition of the West Block, Defence Minister Anita Anon wouldn't rule out sending weapons. I'm working with my cabinet colleagues on ways to further support Ukraine, and I will have more to say on those options. Some believe adding further to Ukraine's arsenal has to be weighed against whether the Kremlin will regard it as further provocation when diplomatic resolutions are still possible. Weapons shipments to Ukraine are in a way a form of escalation of the conflict. Um, of course, Russia sees this as also preparation for war. And for Ukrainian Canadians, these are difficult times. There's a lot of stress. Uh, there's a feeling of helplessness. People are just, uh, you know, focused on doing uh, what they can to con convince the Canadian government on the next steps. Next steps like economic sanctions against Russia or weapons support for Ukraine. Michael Couture, Global News, Ottawa. In New Brunswick, there are growing concerns that a controversy, including a doctor, is causing other medical professionals to leave the province. Dr. Jean-Robert Angola says that he was wrongly blamed for causing a COVID-19 outbreak in the spring of 2020. Ross Lord has more on the fallout in the health community and why some say it could undermine the province's immigration efforts. In Campbellton, New Brunswick, a healthcare system that was struggling before the pandemic has become even more shorthanded. Four doctors have moved away since 2020, leaving thousands of patients without a family doctor. The most notable departure, Dr. Jean Robert Rangola. He was accused of breaking COVID 19 lockdown rules and of spreading the virus to his patients. There are physicians who feel very uncomfortable with the situation, and some have actually. I don't know if the Dr. Nagola case specifically did this, but they've, they've moved elsewhere because of the racism that they've experienced. Angola is suing the New Brunswick government, the RCMP and Facebook, alleging he was falsely scapegoated after providing health care in Campbellton for seven years. Who attack you, your patients, the populations, the government, your hospitals? Dr. Angola is not fighting for justice alone. He has the support of a large number of colleagues. More than 600 doctors across Canada wrote a letter to New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs, asking Higgs to apologize for his part in two investigations of Angola, both of which were dropped. Advocates for immigrants fear the treatment of Dr. Angola, an immigrant from Congo, could undermine New Brunswick's ambitious efforts to bring in 10,000 newcomers per year to fill labor market shortages. Well, it's definitely bad PR. It doesn't help. And the moment that you do things differently or bad, we're going to be rejecting you. That's not what true inclusion means to me. That's not what we stand for as Canadians and New Brunswickers. Premier Higgs suggests there's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I would suggest that if all the facts come out in a, uh, in, in a proper hearing and, and if it has to be a court challenge, and then, then, it, then that's, I guess, where it's headed, uh, that will allay those fears. Meanwhile, the province has made an urgent plea for doctors who can help with New Brunswick's pandemic response. Ross Lord, Global News, Campbellton, New Brunswick. To the pandemic now and hopeful signs that the Omicron-fueled fifth wave may have peaked Canada's top doctor says case counts, test positivity and wastewater surveillance all show that infections are falling. But Theresa Tam also warns that hospitalization rates and deaths remain high. Over the past week, an average of over 10,000 people with COVID-19 were being treated in our hospitals each day, surpassing peak daily numbers for all previous waves of the pandemic. This includes over 1,100 people in intensive care units, which is higher than all but the third wave peak. Tam says those numbers underscore the importance of vaccinations to help reduce the strain on hospitals. But if this latest wave has finally peaked, what will that mean for Canada's vaccination strategy moving forward? Jamie Marocker has more on the plans for booster shots. More Canadians have been infected with COVID-19 during this wave than any before but more have also been vaccinated. It's better to be secure than, you know. 
The latest data show just over a third of Canadians already have a third dose. But new Ipsos polling conducted for Global News reveals many aren't eager to get additional shots beyond that. More than half, 56%, express some concern and wonder how many more we may need. I think it's ridiculous to think that we should be getting, you know, a vaccine every four or six months, you know, indefinitely. Data from Israel found fourth doses less effective against Omicron. Experts here agree immunocompromised people warrant an additional boost, but there isn't a clear consensus for everyone else. We need to see now um, what will happen to protection over time um, with third doses. Vaccine manufacturers aren't waiting. Moderna says it hopes to produce a shot capable of tackling multiple variants. The point of actually creating boosters that have different vaccine sort of uh, strains inside of them is to actually shock your immune system a little bit and get it to grow and broaden its immune response. The company is also in phase two trials for a combined flu COVID RSV vaccine. But Dr. Peter Hotez, one of the developers of a patent-free COVID vaccine formula, says until we vaccinate the world, new mutations will emerge. Mother Nature's not being coy with us. She's telling us what she's going to do because she's done it twice. It's going to happen again. We are going to have another major variant of concern. Canada's top doctor says we aren't ready to commit to a new vaccine strategy. I think the global opinion at this point is that the Omicron virus is going to be with us for some time. So we do need to take a longer term approach. Waiting for more data to make a decision that will ultimately impact Canadians' health for years to come. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. British Columbia has announced a shift in its response to the pandemic. BC's chief public health officer says contact tracing is no longer effective and everyone should assume that they've been a close contact of someone with the virus. Dr. Bonnie Henry says the province will manage COVID-19 like it does other illnesses, such as the common cold. We cannot eliminate all risk. And I think that's something that we, we need to understand and accept as this virus has changed and has become part of what we will be living with for years to come. And we have some breaking news now out of Mexico, where there are reports a Canadian tourist has been shot and killed at a resort. Two other Canadians were reportedly also injured in that shooting. It happened today at a resort south of Playa del Carmen. According to the state's security chief, he tweeted that the gunman was also a guest and that police are now hunting for that suspect right now. Global Affairs Canada says it is aware of the reports, but because of privacy concerns, is not releasing any other information. And we're learning more tonight about the circumstances surrounding the tragic deaths of four people, including a baby, near the U.S. border in Manitoba. Court documents suggest the suspect in the alleged human smuggling operation may have been part of three other cases. Brittany Greenslade reports. Their last hours were spent on a treacherous journey, attempting to cross into the U.S. from Manitoba. And police say the man accused of facilitating it is 47-year-old Steve Shand. Court documents reveal U.S. Homeland Security believes this is part of a larger human smuggling operation involving Shand. He's accused of smuggling 11 Indian foreign nationals across the border this week, including the four who died in the extreme cold. When you're faced with no other choices, um, sometimes you're forced to make choices that um, are dangerous. Shand was arrested while driving a 15-passenger van with two of the migrants inside. Five others were picked up walking. They each had what appeared to be new black-in-color winter coats with fur-trimmed hoods, black gloves, black balaclavas, and insulated rubber boots, according to court documents. U.S. authorities suspect Shand is connected to three other recent smuggling incidents. In one case, three sets of footprints were found, all made by the same brand of boots. On another occasion, a backpack with a price tag showing a value in rupees. A cost that many in desperation still pay, this week with their lives. And it's possible no one will be held accountable here. Even though some of the activity had taken place in Canada, um, it's unlikely that there would be a prosecution uh, in Canada. Shand is expected to appear in federal court Monday. Brittany Greenslade, Global News, Winnipeg. The Alberta Premier's pandemic plans. Coming up, our interview with Jason Kenney, including his blunt assessment of Canada's environment minister.
Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says there are signs that province has reached and surpassed its peak of COVID-19 cases in the fifth wave, but he's also warning that record high hospitalizations are rising and putting a huge strain on health care resources. Our Mercedes Stevenson sat down with Jason Kenney today. So Mercedes, what did he have to say about when the restrictions will end? Well, Jeff, he said that he thinks COVID will come back, but the pandemic won't. He believes it will move into an endemic rather than a pandemic, which is more like the annual flu. So he sounds pretty optimistic. And that's interesting because we remember the experience that he had after the summer and fall when he declared the best summer ever. Alberta opened up and then they had this dramatic wave of COVID-19. The premier says the difference between then and now is the level of vaccination. In the summer, it was only around around 75% of Albertans. He says it's now closer to 90%, and that is the difference between Omicron and the Delta variant for Albertans. Take a listen to what he had to say about when he thinks all restrictions will lift, which is what the United Kingdom is doing right now. So we will proceed uh, cautiously and prudently, but I think we will be in a position to substantially uh, re re release uh, public health measures that we have in, the, in this province, which are far less stringent than, for example, in, in central Canada, and, um, and to move, because we have to just l learn to live with this. Jeff, Premier Kenny thinks that the height of those hospitalizations is likely to be around the end of January or beginning of February, so after that would be when he's looking at lifting restrictions. Interesting. And on a separate note, we've also heard Kenny express concerns about the federal government's plans to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. So what did he have to say about that today? Yeah, well, Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo had said that uh, in an interview, they're looking to phase out fossil fuel subsidies in about two years. Jason Kenney says that's news to him, and he had a pretty strong term to describe the new federal environment minister. Listen to this. Well, if that is in fact the case, they haven't said that to us bluntly, but there's certainly a lot of suggestions that they, I mean, the, the appointment of Stephen Gibo, a, a former uh, environmental extremist uh, to the environment ministry is very concerning to us. So a uh, former environmental extremist. We'll see what the federal government's response to that is. It gives you a sense of the tensions, Jeff. Kenny says that even though there is a difficult relationship at times with Ottawa on things like oil and gas and climate change, they continue to work together to try to deal with the COVID-19 situation. As you know, he has a very different view on things like truckers being vaccinated, and we'll explore all of that on the West Block with him on Sunday. Looking forward to that. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks. So now I look at the healthy side of the menu. What's on here? Salmon. <laughs> Still ahead, remembering a lifetime of laughs with the late Louis Anderson. <laughs> a young Boston Bruins fan got quite the surprise from an NHL star last night. Hey, what's up? This is BM63. Just walking off from uh, warm-ups. Hope, uh, I don't know whose phone this is, but uh, hope you have a lot of fun tonight, because I know I'm going to. <laughs> that is Halifax-born Brad Marchand recording a message on a fan's phone following the pregame skate. Now, the night didn't quite go as planned. Marchand left the game after taking a big hit, but his Bruins did defeat the visiting Washington Capitals 4-3. Pop superstar Adele broke down in tears as she announced that she's postponing her highly anticipated Las Vegas residency. My show ain't ready. We've tried absolutely everything that we can to put it together in time and for it to be good enough for you, but we've been absolutely destroyed by delivery delays and COVID. Adele made the emotional announcement on Instagram, adding that half of her team has COVID-19. The 24-date residency was supposed to kick off at Caesars Palace tonight. Up next, from his distinct singing voice to the silver screen, remembering Meatloaf. Louis Anderson, whose comedy and acting career spanned more than four decades, has died. The only time I want to eat salmon 
is when I'm watching the animal planet and a grizzly plucks one from a stream. <laughs> I think to myself, I should give salmon another try. <laughs> he makes it look so delicious. Anderson got his big break as a stand-up comic in the 80s, but became a regular on TV with his cartoon series Life with Louie. Anderson was nominated for an Emmy four times and won in 2016 for his role on Baskets. Anderson was 68 years old. And one of rock music's biggest stars has also died. Meatloaf, the singer and actor best known for the album Bad Out of Hell, was 74. Mike Drolet has more on his rock and roll legacy. But I remember Was there anybody quite like Meatloaf? He was a force in everything he did, uniquely flamboyant and gifted with a voice that set him apart. I can see paradise by the death for light. He had a peculiar kind of voice. He was known as a Heldon tenor. And a Heldon tenor uh, translates as heroic tenor. And it's the kind of voice that you, know, you would need in a uh, Wagnerian opera. The story he liked to tell was that he only discovered he could sing after being hit in the head by a 12-pound shot put at a high school track meet. The man born Marvin Lee a day was a natural storyteller, and after moving to Hollywood as Meatloaf, a nickname he picked up playing football in high school, the spotlight found him. As the biker from the freezer in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, he caught the attention of composer Jim Steinman. Together, they would create Bad Out of Hell, one of the best-selling albums of all time. Meatloaf owned the 70s, and then disappeared in the 1980s after he lost his voice, suffered a nervous breakdown, and had a falling out with Steinman. I have heard his relationship with Jim Steinman described as uh, a grumpy old married couple. They needed each other, but sometimes they just couldn't stand each other and they would fight. But eventually they would make up and get back to work. Right In the early 90s, they reunited for Meatloaf's biggest hit. I would do anything for love. And he rediscovered his love of acting. My name is Bob. Bob. He appeared in 65 films and kept touring refusing to stop even after collapsing on stage, because with Meatloaf, there was always another act. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is the National War Memorial in Ottawa. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.